Here you're about to see a great back and forth between Pastor Cliff and this atheist student, and they unpack a lot about morality and whether it's objective or relative, and there's a lot of interesting insights that come from it. So we're going to just dive right into it right now. Do you think that it's possible to both think that the best answer is atheism, that, that I can logically disprove the existence of the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, yet through knowing my own limitations, through knowing that logic itself can be flawed, that our brains cannot understand everything. Is that enough of a doubt to admit the kind of faith that's required to believe in God? Sir, all you've got to do is look at the evidence for the reliability of Christ. Then you say, no, I'm sorry, not enough evidence. I can't believe. But when you say that, what you are clearly saying is, <laughs> Before I trust anything to be true, it must meet this level of evidence. So my two questions for you then are, in light of the fact that Jesus Christ is not supported by enough evidence, what is the object that you have chosen to trust in? And secondly, what is the preponderance of evidence that supports this option as being more reliable than Christ? I would say that the discussion isn't between two different things that explain the, the the environment that we see, but it's a very specific proposition of either an all-knowing, all-powerful God exists, or it doesn't. And I believe that the evidence supports the second. And I don't think that you need to, that that, that argument specifically requires there to be something else that you believe in. Just like, I mean, you can talk about the non-existence of something. If it were, if it logically would impact your life in some way, and it doesn't impact your life in that way, then it doesn't exist without positing something else instead. Tonight, when you put your head on your pillow, tonight when I put my head on my pillow, like it or not, you are living for something or someone. Like it or not, I'm living for someone or something. You have said the reason that you cannot believe in Christ is because of a lack of evidence. No, I said a lot of evidence against. That's a very important difference. All right, fine. Evidence against. Okay. So what I need to challenge you to do is explain to me what or who you are living for, and why? What's all the evidence that points to whatever the option is you've chosen other than Christ? What's this overwhelming evidence that has convinced you that this option is more trustworthy than Christ? I, I, I believe in flourishing, in human flourishing, in eudaimonia. I believe that, that we have goodness in our lives, that there are good things to experience, good things to learn and be. I mean, it, it's, there, there is an inherent goodness to human life that has no relationship with anything higher than humanity. And once you acknowledge that there's something higher than humanity, it belittles us. I, I, I specifically, just so I don't get off topic, that what I live for is flourishing. Who so defines flourishing? I do, for myself. Fine. And the KKK defines flourishing for themselves. That's fine. It's that doesn't fine? mean they're right. And the terrorists who bombed and shot people in Paris define flourishing for themselves. Yeah, but now you're you're making so you asked what I live for. You did not say, do I believe in some sort of absolute good? I, I did. I did not. I asked you, how do you define flourishing? Who defines flourishing? We each define flourishing. Okay. Now, if you think about it, you're going to realize you've thought it one way. Define flourishing one way. The terrorists have obviously defined it another way. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. It's all relative. I'm not mm. Cliff's making a good point here. When it comes to flourishing or whatever sort of morality and defining it ourselves, like we're all going to have different interpretations of morality, making it relative. And something to be said is there are certain things where it's hard to call it relative. Like, for example, I think we could, most of us, hopefully all of us could agree that, for example, it's kind of cruel, but like raping an innocent woman, I think we can all agree that that's, that's just straight up wrong. That should never happen. And yet it does. And if morality is all just relative, it's more of a matter of taste. It's not so much that it's good or bad, it's just that we personally don't like it, but ultimately it's okay. And I'm not convinced of that. I think that relativism it tolerates it's very tolerable 
of morality and different people's cultures and stuff. I don't think that we should ever tolerate evil. Evil's just wrong. I think that we all have a really innate sense of justice in our soul, in our conscious. We have this intuition. We know when somebody's wronged us, and we know when we've wronged others. Even when we were a kid, I think, I think that we all had a sense of fairness in our lives. You know, we saw when something was fair versus unfair. You know, if we're in kindergarten and the kid next to us gets two candy snacks and we only get one, we're upset. Why? Because we recognize the unfairness. And, you know, maybe we get jealous or something. But the, the point is, is that we all universally recognize these things. And for us to say that it's relative or maybe it's determined by our culture, there's some flaws in it. Like if culture determines the morality in the area or situation, then we'd have to concede that what the Nazis were doing with all of the genocide and murdering of the Jews, we'd have to call it acceptable. But we know that that's not right. Deep in our hearts, we know that what the Nazis did is a terrible atrocity. And I think that we all could see that. And now I'm not saying that if you believe in moral relativism, that you're a bad person, not by any means. Almost all of my atheist friends are kind, loving people. But there's just some flaws in this exact line of thinking that can be hard to address. And I'm going to let Cliff get back to it now. He's going to jump into a different question, still related to value. A lot to get here. Let's go. How is God giving us value more intrinsic than us giving ourselves value? Because if there is no God, your number came up in a Monte Carlo game. You are a freak accident of nature. You do not get value out of a freak accident. You get nothing. You get meaninglessness then you have to create your own value. But if you choose not to create the same value tomorrow that you did today, you're not wrong. You're not right, because it's all a crapshoot. It's all, do you like broccoli or corn? What's your taste? Oh, tomorrow you like the other one more than the one you like today? Just taste. So you want to be Mother Teresa today? Great, go be Mother Teresa. Tomorrow you want to be Adolf Hitler? Just your taste, go ahead. It's all meaningless, sir. Despair is honest atheism. Despair is honest atheism. Don't take it from me. Really fundamental Nietzsche, logical Camus, disagreements. Sartre knocked it right out of the ballpark. No, I mean, you yes. can't just say these things. That Read if a person yourself. makes a decision, it's inherently arbitrary. That any person can't make the you're you're even bringing up Camus. You're even bringing yeah. up the people who specifically said that people are the ones who make decisions about meaning. And it's all relative. No, it has it's all meaningless. Rel- well, just read L'Etranger by Camus. First lines of the book are the words of a young teenage boy who says, "Yesterday, mother died, or was it today? Who gives a rip? Life is meaningless." It doesn't matter whether mother died last week or yesterday. Life is absurd. And that's what Camus struggled with. And that's why Camus said the only question modern man must answer is, why not commit suicide? Why go on sucking wind and living? If it's all meaningless, if it doesn't matter whether you're Adolf Hitler II or Mother Teresa II, realize life is a meaningless trip. For somebody who hasn't really, well, first of all, well said, Cliff. Really respect it. For somebody who's never really thought of morality on a deep level or gone deep into like our sense of meaning and tried to understand it, this might not make too much sense or sound like really crazy what Cliff is saying. But for me, like just 10 months ago, like I was an atheist. I was an atheist my entire life. And to be honest, I never really thought much about the meaning of life. I just was kind of living pretty surface level. Um, Just indulging in just a lot of things of this world, you know, but as time went on and life got harder, I started to really struggle, you know, day after day with just, just everything piling up, you know, like everybody, everybody goes through their stuff and, and times get hard for everybody. Everybody has tough things. And 
I tried to understand why I was going through these hard times and suffering so hard. And I couldn't find a great answer. There was this book I read called Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. And he was this Jewish doctor who was in a, a concentration camp. And he just saw people dying left and right. But the people who believed in God, they were the ones that had the will to survive, to push on. And it was so interesting to him that people believing in, in this God could give them so much hope and desire and sense of purpose in their life, even when they have no clothes on their back, even when they have no foods in their stomach. Everything was ripped away from these people, and yet they were still strong, so strong. It was just such an anomaly to him. And that really got me thinking about how I don't really have a meaning in my life at this point. You know, I was looking around, let's see. What was my meaning? I guess my meaning I thought was to just have fun and to pleasure myself. You know, I'd suffer, but in any times that I could relax, I'd just smoke marijuana, do other drugs, smoke nicotine, have a lot of casual sex, and just drown myself in video games. And I thought, I thought that was all there was to life. I mean, of course, I saw, you know, Maybe I could have some business ventures and whatnot, or this and that in the future, but I realized that all ultimately is kind of meaningless. Like, okay, yeah, I can create my own meaning and let's say I want to become a famous doctor or a writer or an author or something. But at the end of the day, like, I'm going to die and leave it behind and, you know, maybe I leave a legacy, but then those people die too. And then one day our world might end in a heat day, de a heat death or however it happens and I mean, that's the end of it. It's all kind of meaningless in the end if you look at it like that. And man, I think that's where I could really identify why, where my depression came from. Because I was depressed. I was struggling. I was having a really tough time in my life. And I was desperate. And that's, and that's right around the time that Christ freed me from all that. He helped me understand that I'm a human created in the image of God and that I'm really valuable and that he gives me a purpose. That purpose being to glorify him and worship him and to love him with everything I have and to love you with that same love. And Christ has done so much for me. Yeah, like when I say he gave me a new heart, I was able to walk away from my addictions, to break away from the casual sex and to embrace real meaningful loving relationships with people and to wake up and just look at the world and look at the trees and the birds and the grass and just appreciate everything and be so much more grateful for all that God has given me and he's given me such a great peace that I've never had in my entire life like I'm telling you I just want you to have this immense peace in your heart that that he has given me but I know that can sound like so hard to believe it's like there's this spirit in the sky and in the whole universe and all around us even right now and it's it can be hard to understand or even hard to b believe you know you hear these stories in the bible about 700 900 year old men people living in whales the sea being split and you can just immediately get turned off by it but please i urge you if this is true it's the greatest news that you could ever hear well, I encourage you just please relax just relax your mind be more open to the possibility of there being an all-powerful God who loves you who gives you value who wants you to know him and so I encourage you to approach that by reading the Gospels in the Bible not as the Word of God not as some fairy tale but as a historical text because the evidence shows that the Bible is a historical text and Examine Jesus, how he lived, died, rose again, his ethical teachings, and all there is to him. And decide for yourself whether Jesus is a liar, whether he's mentally insane, or that he's actually the Lord of your life. If you're already a Christian, it's good having you here. And if you're not, I'll I'll be praying for everybody who watched this video that God will come to you and help give you an open mind to hear and see what he's 
he's done for you and me through Jesus. God bless you as you make that most important decision. Bye-bye.